Okay. Good evening. It's November 7th, 2022. Uh, we're holding this meeting based on the open meeting law that was confirmed by the legislature earlier this year. Um, the meeting is accessible by real time, by Zoom, by phone, and Amherst Media. Given that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm calling this special town council meeting to order at 5.03. I'm going to call upon each counselor and they have to confirm that they can hear me and I can hear them. And then I'm going to explain how the next two hours are gonna go. So uh, when you uh, call your name, please unmute your mic and then mute it again. Shalini Baumilne. Yes, present. Patty Angelis. Present. Anna Devon Gothier. Present. Lynn Griesmer is present. Mandy Johanneke. Present. Anika Lopes. Present. Michelle Miller. Present. Dorothy Pam. Here. Pam Rooney. Here. Kathy Shane. Here. Andy Steinberg. Present. Jennifer Taub. Present. And I have not seen Alicia yet, but we'll look out for her. Okay. Um, actually, this meeting is a most unusual meeting for anybody to observe uh, because basically we sit here and read. Uh, this meeting will be followed at seven o'clock by the Budget Coordinating Committee, which is actually uh, in this case, represented by the whole council, the finance committee, the school committee, and Jones Library trustees. It will begin at seven. And then at eight or thereabouts, we will end, go into our regular town council meeting. There is no public comment during this five o'clock special meeting. Each of you have received a packet. In that packet are three specific items. One is a set of 13 individual counselor evaluations. The second is a composite of all of that information from the evaluations. So you can either read them by the individual evaluation or you can read them by the question. And the third is the beginning, and I do wanna stress the word beginning, draft of a memo for the town manager that eventually we will, we as a council will have to come to consensus on and pass. Your goal tonight is to read the evaluations and we'll begin a discussion about the memo, but I will also be inviting people to send me individual, please do not reply all, uh, comments regarding where they think there should be additions or changes to the memo. That memo will not come back to the council it, and the earliest it will come back is on November 21st. Um, and we may still be working on it on December 5th when we do the state of the town address. So we're gonna also try to take a break at about 10 minutes of seven because at seven o'clock, as I mentioned before, we'll be going into the next meeting. So with that, um, I'm. please go ahead. You, uh, your cameras do not need to be on. There is a camera on the whole town room. Uh, and please um, let me know if you need anything. Thank you, bye. Make sure you mute. I need to have the record show that Alicia Walker has joined the meeting. Thank you.
let that attendee know what's going on right now. I'll address them. Um, we see that there is someone in the audience and we welcome you. Uh, we are now in a reading period that will go on till seven o'clock tonight. And then we will be um, beginning our next phase of our meeting, which is the financial indicators. And that will go for approximately an hour. And then we will move on to our regular town council meeting. Um, you're welcome to stay. Um, but the next from now till seven o'clock might be just a little boring. Thank you.
We are going to take a break in about five minutes, fully recognizing that we're not done. Okay. Except for reading your ratings wrong. <laughs> we're going to technically have to adjourn this meeting. Thank you. The good news is it didn't it didn't change. I don't think I only state. To be clear, we're not just right. We are now at seven. Oh, I'm sorry, at six fifty, <laughs> and so I'm going to adjourn the first meeting. We're going to make take a ten minute break, and then we. I'm sorry. We're going to take a ten minute break. Then we will come back for the second meeting, which is the financial indicators meeting. And uh, we welcome our visitors and we'll make sure that we talk about that. Bye.
this meeting's adjourned. And we're coming back at exactly seven o'clock. Meantime, some members of the school committee are joining us. Thank you. Thank you. 
Is it your laptop that's being shown? Is it your laptop that's being shown? Is this is this you or who's? No, it's over here. Okay. There's a random. See where it says and a public comment period. There's randomly and urge. I'm sorry. What are Are they from the press? It doesn't matter. There's press in the room. As town councilors return, as well as school committee members and Jones Library people join us, please turn your picture on so I know that you are back in the room. Athena, I don't know if you can hear me, but um, Jen LaFountain and I think it's just Jen LaFountain needs to be brought in to the, as a panelist. Got it, thank you. Thank you. Athena, also um, Sonia Aldrich, if you could bring her over. And I think I see Jennifer Shao is in the as a attendee as well. I'm going to ask uh, the town clerk to the town council to take the center the notice down. Thank you. And we can begin to just look. We're going to be ready to start fairly soon. And the last one, I promise, uh, Athena, if you could bring Holly Drake into the room. She's in the uh, attendees list. Thank you, Sean. Good evening. Um, it is November 7th, 2022. This is a meeting of the budget coordinating group, otherwise populated by the town council, the finance committee, 
the school committee and the Jones Library trustees. On November 7th, 2022, an act was signed into law, which extends the su suspension of certain provisions of the open meeting law. This allows us to meet remotely without a quorum of councils in the room. However, tonight we have a quorum in the room and to pro provide adequate alternatives. Those include Zoom, phone, and Amherst Media, as well as welcoming all of you into the room. Given that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm calling the November 7th joint special joint meeting of the town council, finance committee, school committee, and library trustees to get to order at 701. After I done get done making sure all of them can hear me and we can hear them, I'm going to be calling on the chairs of the other bodies to call their groups together. So, uh, Shalini Balmion. Present. Thank you. Pat DeAngelis. Present. Anna Devlin Gothier. Present. Lynn Griesmer is present. Mandy Jo Haneke. Present. Anika Lopes. Present. Michelle Miller. Present. Dorothy Pam. Here. Pam Rooney. Present. Kathy Shane. Here. Andy Steinberg. Present. Jennifer Taub. Present. Alicia Walker. Present. And I'm now going to call on Allison McDonald, the chair of the school committee, to convene your meeting. Seeing a presence of a quorum, I'm calling to order this meeting of the Amherst School Committee. Um, and we'll take a roll call. We have, um, I think, three or four, three members uh, remote. Um, but uh, Jennifer? Present. Allison present. Irv? Irv present. Peter? Peter present. Ben? That's it. We're in order. Uh, Austin Surratt, please call the Jones Library trustees to order. Thanks, Lynn. Uh, so we're calling this meeting of the Jones Library Board of Trustees to order. Uh, I think there is a quorum present. I see folks on the Zoom. So I'm going to call and just ask you to acknowledge your presence. Bob Pam. Present. Thank you, Bob. Alex. Present. Tammy. Present. Lee Edwards. Present. Uh, Austin Sarrett is present. Uh, so we have a quorum. Lynn. Thank you. And Andy Steinberg, the Finance Committee. You've, I've already done the counselors, but please uh, acknowledge the presence of other members of the Finance Committee. Yes, uh, just so that everyone knows, the uh, charter provides for resident members of the finance committee to join with uh, the council members. There are three resident members and I'm gonna, I think they were participating remotely. Uh, Bob Hegner. Present. Uh, Bernie Kubiak. Present. And Matt Halloway. Present. Thank Great. you. Thank you. I want to note that we do have a someone in the group that is recording as well as the press. Is there anyone else who plans to record this meeting? Please raise your hand at this time. I might mention that the meeting will be recorded by Amherst Media and be available uh, after the meeting via a uh, video. There is no chat room for this meeting. If you have technical issues, please let me know. Um, or the clerk of the town council, who is Athena O'Keefe over here. Um, please, if you want to ask a question, and there is no public comment in this particular meeting, but for those of us that are, who are convened either by the school committee, the Jones Library Trustees, or Finance Committee, or the town council, you'll, if you're going to ask a question, please reuse the raised hand button. Uh, and if technical issues arise regarding the entire remote participation, we'll decide what to do at that time. After this meeting, there will be a regular meeting of the town council. It will begin at eight o'clock or there so or after. 
uh, immediately following this meeting, unless we can get to take a break. And we'll include various other items we're already talking about, as well as a public comment period. Um, so with that, I'm going to call on Paul Bachman and Sean Mangano to introduce the rest of the fiscal staff who are here and proceed with the presentation <coughs> on the fiscal indicators. Well, Thank you, Lynn. Paul, before and, we get st started, um, Athena, can you just enable share screen for me? Do we need to bring Doug Slaughter Perfect. from the audience? So I'll get started. So thank you, Lynn, and thank you to all the members of the school committee and the trustees who are here today. Um, this is a presentation um, that, that we do annually. Tonight, it's a team effort. Our brilliant team led by finance director, Sean Mangano, and of course by Sonia Aldridge, our comptroller who announced that she is retiring next year. Sonia has provided strong guidance over the town's finances for decades, and we thank her and she's not leaving yet and she's got a budget to get through. And so we look forward to working with you, continue, continue working with you, Sonia. Um, we're also joined by Holly Drake, our assistant comptroller, Jennifer LaFountain, our treasure collector, and Kimberly Mew, our principal assessor. This is a strong team, and we all got decided, we all got together and decided that Sonia should actually make the entire presentation, but I don't think she's gonna do that. Um, but seriously, this is a process that is unusual in most communities, but it's a tradition in Amherst. It's about communication early on in the budget process, ensuring that we all start off on the same foot. This is the first step of our, our budget process before goals are set or anything. So it's a very important meeting. It's our staff's opportunity to share key financial information with you, the elected decision makers for the town. Tonight's agenda takes glances back at FY22, does a quick assessment of where we are in FY23, our current fiscal year, and looks ahead to 24, FY24 and beyond. Okay, the next slide. There are several key takeaways from the presentation tonight. First, we have major challenges ahead of us. Rising costs are impacting all of our operations, increased um, interest rates and rising costs are in, impacting our capital projects. Uh, we are recognizing the pressure the economy is placing on taxpayers and uh, the need to make investments we, that with the ability to maintain our fiscal stability. Um, and what's important for us is that without strong financials in our town, none of this will be, will be possible. We also want to identify some important accomplishments like these. Um, we will show you that we have um, been able to maintain a solid financial position for the town. This matters when it comes to maintaining current town services or when we enter the bond market to borrow funds. This is what they look at. Um, in FY23, we've, we've, uh, the town council approved a balanced budget with no override. And we have maintained the discipline to build our reserves with the eye to address our many new needs and capital. And we work from a solid financial base. I've been, I mentioned this several times, outside bond rating agencies reaffirmed our strong fiscal management and the steps we have taken to prepare for the future. We have strong systems in place that protect us. And that is due primarily to the attention of our accounting department and finance officers. What's important is that we work together. We take a team approach to problem solving and addressing major issues as they arise. This includes our partners at the school, at school superintendent Morris and library director Sherry. And we have managed to maintain steady growth at a pace that we can afford. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Sean, who's gonna make some additional presentations, I think. Yeah. Yep, thank you. So um, the goal for tonight is to update the council and the public on the town's performance in several key areas. Uh, we've noted on this, uh, a number of the slides where we believe the trends are either favorable for the town, unfavorable, or if they're marginal, they're not changing much. Um, and we've also noted which areas we feel have the greatest uncertainty as we move forward. Uh, as Paul noted, we're fortunate to have this process where we have used this system uh, for at least the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years. Um, so that we have a consistent system to measure the town's fiscal condition. So um, I'm lucky that we have this. So this first uh, comparison looks at the uh, sources of revenue for the operating budget. It compares FY23 to FY14, so it's a 10-year comparison. As you can see, like almost every other city and town in Massachusetts, property taxes are the largest source of revenue. Um, and as you can see, there's a been a shift the last 10 years to a greater reliance on property taxes. 
Uh, some of this growth is COVID related. State aid was flat in FY21 um, because the, the state's revenues were uncertain and our local receipts declined significantly and are still recovering from the pandemic. Over the next few years, uh, we will look to create more balance between our funding sources that you see here. Um, we can do that by advocating to the state for increased aid, which was successful in FY23. We saw uh, the largest increase in state aid that we've seen in at least 10 years and by generating more revenue through our local receipts. This comparison is similar to the last one, but this looks at our major categories of expenses. So what you can see here is that the operating, uh, the operating budgets of the town have declined over the last 10 years. If you see the, uh, the town slice, the elementary school slice, and the regional slice have all dropped. Uh, what has gone up is capital, miscellaneous, and other uh, or unappropriated uses. So capital has risen intentionally. We've uh, been systematically trying to grow the amount of the tax levy that we set aside for capital um, to do a better job of funding capital in town, but also to prepare for the four building projects. So the capital one is something that was a strategic decision over time. Uh, miscellaneous has increased because of our pension assessment. Uh, we continue to have steep increases in our Hampshire County assessment each year um, as we try to fund past years where retiree uh, assessments were not as enough. We are now making up that difference every year. Um, and at least for the next 10 years, we will continue to have large increases to make up for that difference. And then the last area, unappropriated uses, that has gone up quite a bit. And that's because of charter tuition has grown significantly over this period of time, over $800,000 um, over this 10 year span. And then our regional transit system costs have gone up significantly as well. The one thing I'll note here is the elementary school drop is a little bit, um, there's a piece of that that's a little bit misleading. And that's because of an accounting adjustment. Back in FY14, we used to include charter tuition in the elementary school budget. At a subsequent year, we decided no longer to take charter tuition uh, or put charter tuition in the elementary school budget. We took it out and made it a town-wide expense. Um, so that makes about a percentage point difference if you didn't have the charter tuition back in FY14. Um, so still a drop, still uh, the trend is still there, uh, less for operating budgets as these other, uh, other uses have grown. And I'm gonna pass it off to Jen LaFountain who's gonna talk about property taxes. Good evening, everyone. Um, so this slide is about property tax revenue, and it is the primary source of both operating and capital spending. This includes new growth that has been averaging about 720,000 annually over the last 10 years. Annual increases are limited to by proposition two and a half, unless the town passes an operating override. And this was last done in fiscal year 11. Um, with the blue line being actual dollars and the red line being constant dollars on here for coloring purposes. And this is adjusted for inflation. So we're going to go to the next slide. Uncollected property taxes. Um, this slide gives you a 10 year history of uncollected taxes as a percentage of the net levy. Um, FY20, you can see, is slightly higher, and that's due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, as a reminder, the town had adopted an extended due date for the fourth quarter taxes, pushing the due date from May 1st to June 30th without any penalty. And this also pushed the demand bills into July into the next fiscal year. So some of that revenue was collected in the next, in the next fiscal year. Um, the percent of uncollected taxes at the end of July was back under 2%, which is more in line with what we expect to see. Overall, this slide shows our collection rates to be very favorable to the bond rating agencies as we have remained well below the 5% or above warning indicator. Um, we also wanted to share that in addition to this low percentage of uncollected property taxes, um, we were also able to collect somewhere around $400,000 in tax title money in fiscal year 22. And a tax title is a lien that's placed on property to enforce the collection of property taxes. And once paid in full, that lien is then removed. And we're gonna go on to the next one. Um, so this is the um, state aid in both actual and constant dollars. Um, the state aid dollar amounts have steadily risen. Uh, the dollar amounts have risen over 
the last several years, um, other than in FY21, where there was a drop due to the pandemic. But you can see when it's adjusted for inflation, it's not rising nearly as um, fast, which is again, the red line. And as a matter of fact, um, it's been pretty flat. FY21 is currently, uh, when adjusted for inflation, just a smidge higher than we were in 2013. Uh, we should see a rise in state aid, as Sean just said, um, for FY23. It's one of the largest increases we've seen in years. Um, however, with the uh, change in governor, it creates uh, some uncertainty in the future years. Uh, so you can go to the next slide. So this is state aid as a um, state aid as a percentage of the operating revenues. So state aid currently accounts for about twenty percent of our operating revenues. Uh, state aid peaked for us in two thousand and eight, where we received approximately sixteen point nine million dollars. Back then, that was a percentage of approximately twenty eight percent of our operating revenues. Back then. Um, so this percentage has been declining with, you know, a few small increases here and there, but we're still well below that peak from 14 years ago. And um, as this slide shows with our 10 year, uh, we are still one full percentage point um, plus below where we were 10 years ago in terms of uh, percent of operating revenues. While the dollar amounts are increasing most years, it's not keeping up with the annual budget increases or inflation. And uh, as stated earlier, this puts more and more of our reliance on the increases in property taxes, which are capped by Proposition two and a half. So it, it really does limit our total budget from year to year. Go to the next slide. Um, so this is the uh, state aid history, just shown in a slightly different way. You will see the um, cherry sheet receipts are shown in red. Our cherry sheet charges are shown in green. And then the net state aid is the purple line. This line shows us the amount that we're actually able to appropriate for spending. And it has been um, gradually increasing uh, in the last few years after a couple of years. Um, most of the time when we see an increase in our state aid, we're also seeing an increase in the assessment as well. So it doesn't um, really seem to amount to a lot more that we're actually able to spend. It is slowly creeping up over the last few years and we're definitely hoping it will again next year. Uh, so the next one is Kim, I believe. Thank you. Um, so our revenues related to our economic growth are um, including meals tax, hotel and motel tax, motor vehicle, building fees and permits, um, and um, as you know, real estate tax. Um, everything has been significantly recovering this year um, and our, our new growth as well, excuse me. Um, so some, some properties that I wanted to just mention that have contributed to our new growth this year um, are 462 Main Street. Um, this property is located just before the railroad tracks on Main Street. Um, if you're coming into town just after the railroad tracks. Uh, one University Drive South um, at the intersection of University Drive and the corner of Northampton Road, uh, sort of across the street from Big Y. Uh, there's also 408 Northampton Road. Um, this property is across Northampton Road from the AutoZone store. Um, and then there's also 133 Southeast Street, which is behind the bank on the corner of College Street. Um, those will also contribute to uh, future growth, as well as 26 Spring Street, which is behind the Town Hall parking lot, and 11 through 13 East Pleasant Street, um, which is where the carriage shops and the pub used to be located. And one thing I'll add real quick. Um, so there's about six or seven developments that are either finished or in process. Um, that will add about $2 million to the tax levy through the new growth process. Um, and the reason we call those out is because that's been really critical in funding some of the new initiatives that the town council and the town manager have put forward. Um, and we know that when we do new development, there's also costs associated with it. So it's not all revenue, um, but new growth has been really critical. Um, and we've seen a lot of it in the last few years. Um, and that's one of the things, one of our messages for tonight is that if we wanna continue to fund new initiatives, new growth will be critical in funding those initiatives. Uh, 
and back to Holly. So this slide here is <clears throat> the revenue um, per capita. Again, um, we do it in both um, actual dollars and constant dollars because when you adjust things for inflation, they're not rising nearly as fast as you expect them to. So this chart compares our three major uh, general fund revenue sources by showing each um, adjusted for inflation, which are the dashed lines, as well as the actual or cons um, actual dollars. The red line at the top of our props, our property taxes, our biggest revenue source. It does increase annually, but only by the allowable limits of Proposition Two and a Half and our new growth, which we were just talking about. So this graph shows that the uh, property tax property taxes have increased, but they're not keeping up with inflation. Uh, in the middle is the state aid, the green lines, our second biggest revenue source. Uh, again, although this is slowly increasing and it, and it seems to be keeping a better uh, pace with inflation, we're still below our peak levels in 2008, as I mentioned earlier. The last revenue shown here are our local receipts, the purple lines. Uh, local receipts have remained relatively flat. Um, and again, they're keeping better pace with inflation, but the local receipts dropped dramatically in um, FY21, obviously due to the pandemic. Uh, FY21 was on approximately 60% of FY20's local receipt numbers. And um, we expect increases in both FY23 and FY24 in this category. And we, we hope to be getting back to uh, close to normal levels with our local receipts. Uh, the next slide. So um, these are our um, operating expenditures, again, broken down into a per capita number. Although our actual expenditures per capita are going up, when they're adjusted for inflation, they still um, are remaining relatively flat. Um, our per capita expenditures in 2021 are higher than they were back in 2013 by just 1.4%. So our expenses have really not gone up um, very much when you adjust that for inflation over a, uh, well, it's a 10 year, but um, it's a nine year period because we don't have the, um, um, oh shoot, I can't think of the word. We don't have the, um, the inflation numbers um, on the um, DOR's website for 2022. So we can only go to 2021 on this slide. Um, this is a major challenge as well for us uh, because our population numbers uh, include some on-campus residents who do not pay property taxes, but they still consume many town services such as using our roads and sidewalks, our parks and commons, our public safety services, as well as our school systems. And um, the next slide will show our expenditures per capita are, are pretty low. And we've been able to manage that through effective uh, financial policies, conservative budgeting and uh, good management in, here in the town. And so Holly, the next is, slide. is it okay if I just yes. echo that point you just yes. made? So, so that Absolutely. previous slide of having low uh, expenditures per capita, it feels like a good thing. It feels like efficiency. Um, but it does, it is one of the major struggles that Amherst specifically has because we're a tax base of somewhere between 20 and 25,000 taxpaying residents trying to support a town of 40,000 residents. Um, so it's an ongoing challenge. It's been noted in previous presentations. Um, again, we, we mark it as favorable because it's, it's good to have low expenses per capita, but it does create real struggles in terms of funding. Um, in terms of providing all the funding for everything that uh, the council and town manager and school committee and everybody wants to do, um, we don't have the tax base uh, uh, to support it the same way you might think when you look at a, a town of 40,000 residents. So I just wanted to really emphasize that point that um, that's a unique challenge Amherst has. Thank you. So here, um, by calculating the data per capita and comparing ourselves to other communities, it makes it much easier to interpret some of this data. Uh, the colors here of the different communities are their bond ratings. The purple is triple A, the blue is double A, and the uh, tan is red on the lower portion. Uh, green is us, that's Amherst, and we are a double A plus rated community. And then the red is the statewide average. This shows that Amherst is below all of our peer communities and well below the statewide average, according to the DOR. 
Um, our spending per capita is roughly half of the statewide average. And so this chart and um, several later on just shows comparables to our peer communities. Uh, we began, I believe, doing this back in about 2007, like Sean said, about 15 years ago. And we were comparing ourselves to a lot of communities that were out east, out in the Boston area. And several years back, we added these more local communities to our comparisons. And I, I don't think it's a coincidence that Dartmouth and Amherst are the lowest two of the communities we're looking at, because both communities do have um, a student, you know, have a UMass campus and a large student population, Amherst to a much greater extent. Um, but I don't think it's a coincidence that we're the two lowest on that top chart. So this is um, our municipal staffing levels. This is the um, staffing levels for the town's general fund only. Um, this does not include enterprise funds or the schools. Schools uh, staffing levels can be found on their website. And the enterprise fund staffing levels have remained pretty constant over the last several years. This chart um, only shows the past 10 years and shows we've added approximately 10 FTEs or full-time equivalents since 2013. Um, many of these positions were in the planning, conservation, and inspections department with the addition of some uh, inspectors and in our general government with the um, just the clerk of the town council, uh, communications manager, just to name a few of those. Our FTEs have remained pretty flat for the last six years. There's been um, not very many positions added. We've been very, very um, careful of when and, and where we have new positions. And this again is the budgeted positions. In FY22, we had a small budget change with the loss of two police officers, but then there were two additional uh, Crest staff members that were added in the FY22 budget. So you don't see a change there. Um, FY23 um, will show a, a, a change with many new positions, um, including the addition of the DEI and the Crest Department. Um, for additional firefighters in EMTs and other grant funded positions that will be added in the FY23 budget. Sean, anything to add there? Good. So the, the um, this is our salaries and benefits as a percentage of the operating budget. The red bar shows our total budgeted salaries and benefits slowly rising, and it's consistent with the charts on the prior slides. Um, as expected, when your staffing levels increase, so do our benefits. Uh, these benefits here include our uh, cost of living adjustments, steps, retirement costs, insurance, including um, both health insurance, life insurance, unemployment insurance, workers' comp, and um, for the benefits. The blue line at the top shows salaries and benefits as a percentage of the total budget. And that has fluctuated a bit over the years, but still remains relatively flat for a long period of time. It averages between 52 to 55% of our budget is spent on salaries and benefits. The green line shows that benefits is a percent of uh, salaries and wages is slowly increasing. Um, the change from uh, self-insured health insurance to a fully insurance group plan when we moved to Maya a few years back has helped, but we expect to see healthcare, um, healthcare costs rise considerably in FY24. Uh, the addition of the two new departments and those employees will increase, increase our benefits cost in the next, um, in the upcoming years. And Sonia, correct me if I'm wrong, but if you look at this chart, um, you'll see in 2018, 2019, that green line start to tick up and kind of go to a new, uh, sort of a new normal. That's when we hit a little bit of an issue with our health insurance trust fund. We had some large claims and we ultimately shifted our insurance to Maya. Um, which came with an adjustment in our premium rates where we had to increase them. Um, and so it stayed, held pretty steady since that point, but that's that was the major cause for that uh, uptick. Yes. Thank you. 
So on back to uh, Jen. Okay, so um, this slide is showing our debt service. This is our annual debt expense as a percent of our operating net revenue. These are our annual principal and interest payments on existing debt. Um, because our debt expense is low currently at 1.1%, we have a greater flexibility to issue new debt. Um, and the debt that we have does continue to drop. And a reason for this is um, a road paving borrowing of 400,000 was paid off in fiscal year 21. Um, you'll see in future years that um, new debt will be starting to be on the books um, for author authorizations approved through the capital improvement plan and debt service is part of the capital budget. So. Yeah, and again, just to echo what Jen said, this looks really good right now, this chart and the next couple that you'll see around outstanding debt. Um, but what these charts don't show are authorized but unissued debt. So debt that the council has approved, but we haven't begun making payments because the project hasn't started or it hasn't finished. Um, in the capital improvement program, we do put a projection of that so you can see where that's going. Um, but there's a number of projects that have been approved that aren't reflected here yet. Um, the Jones Library project is authorized. There's no payments here yet for that. Um, the pumper truck for the fire department was approved. There's no there's no cost yet for that because it takes so long to construct. Um, so there are a number of authorizations that just haven't hit yet where you will start to see these numbers go back up in the coming years. Yep. Um, so this slide, this slide shows us compared to other communities throughout Massachusetts um, below. Um, Below and above is the neighboring communities for debt service as a percentage of the operating budget. This will look different, as Sean said, in the next couple of years as more debt is taken on. Um, and our credit rating is strong due to a low percentage of debt relative to general fund revenue and also to good fiscal management. So Amherst long-term debt load has remained relatively low and has actually decreased in recent years as shown in this slide. Um, this percentage includes both long-term and short-term outstanding debt. And as Sean said in a past slide, um, this does not show authorized, authorized but unissued debt like the Jones Library. And then I'm sorry, I jumped. The... I'm sorry I jumped ahead, Jen. No, th okay. no, that's okay. That's fine. Um, this is a comparison to other communities in Massachusetts below and above a comparison to our neighboring communities showing what our outstanding debt is as a percentage of assessed value for FY20. Um, these charts are long-term outstanding debt only. Currently Amherst is the lowest. Um, this will change as we take on more debt in the next few years as we've mentioned a few times. Um, and again, we remain, we maintain a strong AA plus credit rating as a result of this low percentage of debt relative to our general fund revenue. And the only thing I'll add here, just for the town councilors and for others, um, one of our goals has always been to get to a triple A rating. Um, there's really only one thing that's, well, there's, there's really two things that are holding us back. One we have control over, but the, um, the things that are holding us back are our sort of long-term obligations, our pension obligation, our OPEB obligation, and our debt obligation. But our debt's not the major problem there. Um, but just when you look at these other communities, if you want, want to know why we're not a AAA, um, it's because our pension assessment and our OPEB liability as a percentage of our um, operating budget is above the threshold that the, the rating agencies would like to see. And I think Sonia, you're up next. Good evening, everybody. Um, this is our unfunded liabilities for the town. Uh, the blue is our pension liability and the red is our OPEB liability. Our pension is at 62.4% funded at this point in time, and we are estimated to be fully funded in 20, 2033. Our OPEB is only at 10% at this point. However, once we fully fund our, our um, pension liability, we will start directing more funds towards the OPEB. We, I also wanna point out that these liabilities will fluctuate each time we update our actuary studies, and those are being done now for fiscal year 22, which is why you only see it up to 2020 on the screen right now. 
We've been working on some different scenarios for our OPEB funding plan. The most significant change will be when we start to redirect the funding from, from the uh, pension liability. And also in fiscal year 24, I think, I believe Sean, correct me if I'm wrong, we are hoping to start increasing our contribution to OPEP slightly each year. Yep. There's my slide. This is our uh, reserves. Free cash is blue and the stabilization, the general stabilization fund, we have three stabilization funds now, so I have to remember that is red. The green is our new capital stabilization fund and purple is for reparations. Um, our, current, our current percentage in reserves is 26.7% at this point. Works. Our, our um, current financial policies on our reserves are between, uh, say five, that we should have five, between five and 15% in reserves. We've been intentionally increasing this in preparation for the uh, four major project, capital projects that we have been working on for the last few years. But having good reserves provi provides the town with greater flexibility, such as buying us time to react to any loss of revenue, such as state aid cuts and unforeseen emergencies like a pandemic like a pandemic maybe, if needed. And I just wanna mention that free cash is part of the overall reserves, but that's something that needs to be recertified every new fiscal year. So our certification for this, for this um, free cash ends June 30th, and then we have to get it recertified again. I just wanted to mention it. Did I miss anything, Sean? Um, no, only I just wanted to add that we don't usually show 2023, but we did add it here because we wanted to show the council sort of the um, the results of some of the decisions that we made recently to create a capital stabilization fund and the contributions to the reparation stabilization fund. We, we've adapted this chart so that you can start to see those different pieces. Uh, one thing you'll see here is that free cash, we typically keep at 5%. It's a little bit above 5% right now, um, and that's because of the million dollar uh, appropriation request that's in front of the council uh, for the regional track and field project. So um, this was done, that appropriation hasn't been approved, so that money is still in free cash. But if that appropriation is approved, then that would come out of uh, come out of that blue and bring it right down to the 5%. Sean, are you? And this is the comparison to the neighboring towns for where we're at with reserves and for the Eastern towns with the same demographics that we have. As you can see, we're doing very well. Northampton is a little higher than us because they tend to do operational overrides, which falls through their free cash for them to appropriate in subsequent years. So the, um, the town is currently on solid financial footing as we've tried to articulate. Um, we have a double A plus bond rating. Um, and the town has been able to build reserves to meet its uh, policy goals of five to 15% of the operating budget, while also setting aside additional funds for the purpose of reparations and for capital uh, projects. So as we, uh, actually, I think I went past the slide. Sorry. So for FY23, um, we do have a lot to be proud of. We've done a lot the last couple of years. Uh, for highlights, we continue to have really strong collaboration among elected officials and staff um, across all of the departments. A good example of that is the town council and the school committee and the library trustees working together uh, to advocate with the state for more funding for our library and school projects. Um, and that's just one example recently, but it happens all the time. Uh, for FY23, we originally started with a 2.5% budget increase, but the council approved an additional half percentage point. Um, we really appreciate that. I think it, you know, it acknowledges the impacts of inflation on, um, on our staff and on our operating budgets. And it also um, helps our departments begin to phase in some of the new initiatives that have been approved. Uh, the town has continued to invest in capital, getting the percentage of the levy up to 10%, which has been a long time goal. And we're one of a few 
communities that I'm aware of that set aside regular capital funding for sustainability. Um, we use that, that funding to invest in the strategies outlined in the climate action adaptation and um, resiliency plan. I may have mixed up the A's there, but uh, we created two new departments, DEI and CRESS, and we've used ARPA funds to support key COVID uh, recovery strategies and council initiatives like the four uh, new firefighter and EMTs while also trying to spur future growth that will benefit operating budgets into the future. Um, so we've done a lot in the last couple of years that um, I think we all should be proud of. On the challenge side, we still have a lot of uh, a lot of obstacles to uh, get past. So we're continuing to support the public health department as they manage the sort of ongoing and after effects of COVID-19. Uh, we're working with public safety to start a brand new department where there's not a lot of models out there to uh, imitate. Uh, we're dealing with the impacts of inflation while also trying to grow our tax base, as I mentioned before, um, grow our tax base to support the demand for new services. Uh, we're working to integrate our new fire and EMT positions into our general fund budget and actively working to get strategic partnership agreements uh, in place with our local educational institutions. Uh, these institutions are critical to the future um, health of the town. Um, and we're, we're looking to find ways where we can partner to support the high quality municipal services that support all of the residents in the community. So these agreements are really critical. As we look to FY24, these are some of the assumptions that will be used to build um, the initial projection that you'll see in a few moments. So property taxes, uh, we're projecting the allowable 2.5% increase and new growth of $650,000. Uh, state aid at this current time, we're leaving flat because of the moderate likelihood of an economic downturn next fiscal year, and also just the uncertainty that comes with a new governor um, and that transition. We're projecting significant growth in local receipts, um, which are still a little bit down due to COVID, and we're projecting enterprise fund reimbursements getting back to normal uh, for water and sewer. Uh, these are payments that the enterprise funds make to the general fund for the services that the sort of town hall and uh, staff provide to them. Uh, but we're still not projecting in, uh, in an indirect cost payments for transportation or solid waste. They've struggled, the transportation fund in particular, struggled to get back to where it was pre-pandemic, um, and the solid waste fund always had trouble making those payments. The, the silver lining with those two funds is that they both have new revenue sources that we're going to monitor and that may be able to allow those payments to happen in the future. The solid waste fund has the solar array that's up and running uh, that will make a rent payment to the solid waste fund because it's located on the landfill and the transportation system. We The council approved new permit fees that will increase each year for the next couple of years and that will bring along new revenue. Uh, an override is a vote to increase property taxes more than the allowable two and a half percent in a particular year, and we are not proposing an override uh, at this time. For the operating budgets, uh, we're proposing or projecting at this time a two and a half percent increase. Uh, another example of collaboration, I think, between uh, school and town officials was at the, the BCG meeting a couple months ago. We talked about the charter and choice tuition adjustment uh, that's been made going back several years to the elementary school budget. Um, some, you know, many years it reduced the allocation to the elementary schools. There was a request from the school committee to remove this adjustment. Many of you may remember it's always very confusing when all the departments go up two and a half percent, but the elementary schools will go up 2.3 or 2.4 or something random, whatever it turns out to be. Um, so we've all agreed to remove this adjustment and just everyone's going to get the same two and a half percent each year. Within operating budgets, there's a lot of uncertainty. There's a number of unsettled collective bargaining agreements, both at the schools and at the town. Um, and health insurance costs, as noted earlier, are projected to rise greater than they have in the past. So right now we're projecting an 8% increase for all budgets. Um, and that's based on claims data that we're seeing coming in higher. Uh, a lot of people did not access services during the pandemic. And now many people are getting back to using those services, uh, which is creating a, a higher cost. On the retirement assessment side, as noted earlier, when we um, submitted the proposal for the creation of the Crest Department, uh, we noted that we would be able to fund the salaries immediately within the operating budget, but that the retirement assessment impacts would lag behind because of the, um, the way that the retirement system factors in salaries. So FY24 is the year uh, where the retirement assessment impact will hit. 
So instead of what a typical increase, which is around 7%, we're projecting about 11% increase for FY24, um, which is a significant factor for this year's uh, budget. Uh, capital investment, we're projecting going up to 10.5% of the levy. We got to 10%, and some of the models for the uh, four capital projects uh, push this uh, percentage of the levy up to 10.5%. And then lastly, OPEB, we're proposing an increase of $50,000. Uh, to bring the general fund contribution towards OPEB up to 550,000. Uh, right now, the town is still well below the annual contribution that we would have to make in order to keep our liability from growing. And so in the past, we had a plan to keep uh, increasing these contributions each year a little bit until we got up to that amount. And so this gets us back up, not on track, but it gets us back with some moment momentum to increasing this contribution. And back to Paul. Thank you. So I, I don't know if we actually um, explained what OPEB means. It's, most people may not know that term. It's o other post-employment benefits. That basically is health insurance that we promise to our employees when they retire that we will continue to pay health insurance for them. So that's why that's an unfunded liability that we have to start to fund um, so that the promises that we made to our employees who have retired, we, we can keep those promises. So we looked at the major challenges um, and I, I'm cognizant of our time. So I'm just going to let people read these instead of me reading each one of them. Um, I think we talked a lot on the town side about what the challenges are that, we've, that we're focusing on. Um, the one thing I wanna point out is that we're seeing lower consumption on water and sewer, and that's a good thing for our environment, but it's a hard, it's a hard thing for our enterprise funds because our costs for water and sewer producing them and, and processing waste are not going down, they're going up, and but our revenues are st starting to stagnate. Uh, schools, oh, we want to stay on this, go back to that. So schools have a staffing cost because of unsettled contracts, definitely has facility needs, uncertainty about state aid, um, and then the major changes in moving the sixth grade to the middle school. And for the library, uh, a lot of focus on their endowment, what their endowment is being committed to, and how much they've had to rely on the on the on the endowment. Okay. Um, so in, going forward, um, these are the things that we're paying attention to, which is the economic uncertainty, which is impacting everyone. Um, we're we're seeing a bit of a not slowdown, I wouldn't say, but we're not seeing as many building projects come through as we had previously. Um, we have made a significant commitment to reducing the town's carbon footprint. That doesn't come free. We have to invest to make that happen. Um, we've committed to funding four new positions in the, in the fire department. Those have to be integrated into our bus budget. Um, it's really important from our point of view that we maintain our fiscal discipline so that we can do all the things that we've promised people that we would do. Um, right now, um, with the four building projects that are sitting out there, our needs outweigh our resources. And, we, and the basic thing that we always come down to is what is the impact on the property owner, basically the homeowner who's paying taxes to, to, so we can do these things. Um, so how are we going to handle these things? Going forward, we are going to continue to manage our resources frugally. Uh, we, we have strategies for a prudent use of the reserves that we have built up over time. Um, we'll fight to get more funds. I think in the last two weeks, we've announced over a million dollars in grants that the town staff have been able to um, acquire for capital for um, road and sidewalk improvements. Um, encourage sustainable development. Um, the council will tonight talk about a debt exclusion as part of the strategy. And um, and then as we as we make investments in, uh, in our in our facilities and renewable energy investments, we believe there'll be payback down the road as we reduce our reliance on, on carbon fuels. All right, so almost to the end. So uh, we're going to finish up by looking at the projection, the actual numbers that we're projecting for next year at this point, um, and then look at the calendar really quickly. Um, so this chart represents our initial projection for next year. It'll be discussed in more detail at the Finance Committee meeting tomorrow, um, and it will get amended throughout the budget process with new information. Uh, we break down our revenue projections into four categories, uh, property taxes, local receipts, state aid, and other financing sources. Uh, so in property taxes, as mentioned earlier, we're proposed, uh, projecting a 2.5% increase plus $650,000 of new growth. Um, to represent an overall increase of about 3.7%. In local receipts, we're projecting a number of increases to different categories consistent with our recent experience. 
um, a total increase of 8.2%. State aid, we're keeping flat for now, but we will get the governor's budget um, proposal a little bit later than usual, but we will get it before a budget is submitted. So we will be able to reconcile any, any differences between the proposal and what we project. Um, but it won't be in January like it typically is because of the, the transition in the governor. And then lastly, other financing sources are going down. Um, the ambulance fund uh, is a little bit good, a little bit not bad, but just an adjustment. Uh, so we increased ambulance fees before the pandemic. Uh, we never were really able to realize the uh, increased revenues from those ambulance fee adjustments because the pandemic affected utilization significantly. We're starting to see that uh, higher revenue in the ambulance fund. So we're actually able to increase the amount of support from the ambulance fund to the budget. Um, however, the, the decrease you see here is because in FY23, there was a planned ambulance purchase. So that 2.7 million from the ambulance fund at the bottom uh, included a, a, a ambulance purchase. And we haven't made a decision for FY24, if there will be an ambulance purchase or not, that'll be part of the capital uh, planning process. So there's a little bit of an adjustment there um, just because there's not an ambulance proposed yet for FY24. In the miscellaneous section, you'll see a decrease of 100,000. That's because in FY23, we had an inflation reserve that was funded from uh, old capital projects that were closed out. Again, that may happen again in FY24 as part of the capital planning process, but we haven't uh, put it here yet. And then lastly, uh, FY23 included $500,000 from stabilization to begin to help fund the li uh, Jones Library project. For FY24, we haven't included any reserves to support the building projects. We're working with the finance committee to update the, the different models for the four building projects, uh, especially based on sort of our newer fiscal realities. Um, and when we get closer to a plan, we will update this uh, projection um, with whatever the numbers are from that plan. So the overall impact here is a 2.2% increase in total revenues at this time. On the expense side, uh, operating budgets again going up 2.5% at the top. Uh, the next section is capital, uh, projecting it going up to 10.5% um, for FY24. And the one thing to note with capital is that the first thing that comes out of our capital allocation is any general fund debt and then our the regional school district assessment. Um, so while it seems like a lot, the 10.5%, when you take those two things off the top, you end up with a lower number um, that's available for, for new capital projects each year. In miscellaneous, you'll see the increase to the retirement assessment and the extra $50,000 for the OPEB contribution. Um, and then the last section here, unappropriated uses. These are typically things we are required to set aside or their state assessments. Um, we've used a placeholder for state assessments of a 3% increase. Uh, this is to cover possible increases for charter tuition and for our regional transit services, which are the two biggest pieces. Um, and again, we will have exact numbers, or not exact numbers, but we'll have a, a projection of the numbers from the governor um, before this has to be finalized so that we can update that. So at this point, uh, the difference between our revenues and our expenses for next year is a $200,000 deficit, uh, which is a significant amount, but it's a manageable amount at this early stage in the budget process. And then we will finish with the calendar. So this calendar lists some of the key dates coming up. Uh, the bolded purple are key uh, points for public engagement, and the uh, bolded black uh, wording are key decision points. Um, and so the next uh, key date that is coming up is on November 21st. There is a uh, public forum. It says FY23. It should say FY24, so I apologize for that. I thought I caught all the FY23s from last year. Um, but there will be an FY24 budget public forum on November 21st, um, which is really the, the first and sort of best opportunity to give direct feedback um, on what you'd like to see in the, in the FY24 budget. And the last thing I'll just note quickly is that the uh, resident capital request application is posted um, on the website. If you go to... Um, I think it's called your government. And then under your government is capital planning. On the left-hand side, you'll see the resident capital request application. And there will be a, a news blast tomorrow from our communications director um, with the information. Uh, we've reformatted the process to make the application a little bit easier and to really outline the process and make it uh, more streamlined. Um, and so that's an opportunity for any resident in town to submit a capital request to be considered uh, by the town manager and by the joint capital planning committee. 
Uh, so that application is live and it will, it says here till the 18th, but we've actually extended the deadline uh, for applications. It will stay open until the end of December. And with that, thank you very much. And I'll turn it back to Lynn. Thank and you. And oh, and real quick, all this information is posted on the town website under budget and then upcoming budget. Uh, there is uh, this presentation plus the charts with the, the numbers below the charts. So we're going to ask if there are questions from the town council, the school committee, or the finance committee members, or Jones Library. Peter Demling. Thanks. Um, I, I mean, first of all, big props to the finance department, Sonia, and, and everyone else. I, I think we take it for granted what a great state we are in, in terms of our frugal discipline over years. Um, and we don't, in general, at our public meetings, celebrate our town employees enough and what an amazing job they do in all of our departments. So a, a big thank you there. Um, so my question is for the town manager. Uh, and Paul, my question is, in your final recommendation to the town council for this FY24 budget, how likely are you to increase the recommended elementary school budget by a million dollars or more above and beyond this initial guidance? Recommend that this level be sustained for FY25 and also recommend that a million dollars or more be added retroactively to the current year's FY23 budget. The, the reason I ask is that, as you know, the Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee that represents the Amherst School Committee in contract negotiations is currently in negotiations with our staff unions. And as you probably know, the latest statement from the Regional School Committee notes that the last request from one of our unions prior to mediation would require $14.4 million more than is available in the district budgets approved and given to us by member towns. And as you also know, and everyone at this meeting knows, but not all of the general public understands, and this is the key point here, the Amherst School Committee and the Regional School Committee that represents us in negotiations has no power or authority to set our budget amount. We have clear authority over how to spend our budget, but at the Amherst level, we can only spend what's approved by the Amherst Town Council based on your recommendation. School committee can ask and advocate for more, and we have in the past unsuccessfully for much smaller amounts than a million, but we can't increase our budget without the town council voting to do it. So you're stating how likely you are to increase your school budget recommendation by a million dollars or more for FY23, FY24, and FY25, and if not, why not, would be very helpful for the school committee to hear and for the public to understand. Another million dollars would still be far short of what's needed to cover this request from our union. But hearing you address this would at least provide a general sense of what's even possible from the town's perspective. Thank you. Uh, thank thank you. you. Go ahead. Okay. Paul. So I don't know if that's exactly a question, honestly. Um, sound like a statement, but I respect what you're saying. And um, the the idea of tonight is to present the financial position, the financial picture of the town. So everyone can see the numbers that we're all looking at. Everybody can see them. Anybody with a calculator, anybody with a spreadsheet can go in and look at the same numbers we're looking at and be able to sort of make the calculations that we are. Um, the idea of the public hearing on uh, the 21st, I think it is, is to listen to people who have thought about it and, want, and ask the council to prioritize things as the way they see fit. With, based on those budget guidelines that the council will adopt, we'll begin to build the budget and in, in, um, in accord with those goals. Um, I think, you know, when you're talking about on big numbers, it's really hard to figure that out. We're talking about integrating positions into an existing budget. That's the challenge that we're facing. Andy Steinberg. Yes, thank you. Um, appreciate the presentation. We'll talk about it more at the Finance Committee meeting. There's one question I wanted to ask, Sean, if you had, um, thought about um, as far as whether it can be estimated in value or if there's any way to approach it. But you pointed out very clearly that the uh, amount that we are spending, our spending per capita is skewed because of the university. But there are other things that are skewed because of the university's presence in our community. And I'm specifically thinking about revenue because such a large portion of our land is not taxable and we are not getting um, any significant payment in lieu of taxation from the state or assistance from the university. 
so that uh, we have a large uh, burden on the community and expenditures without any revenue that comes back to us to pay those expenses. Um, and it um, skews us in that other way, but it doesn't show up in our comparisons to other communities as we look at that. And I don't know that I can think of a way to do it, but I did want to at least raise the point and see if you'd given any thought to that. Sean? Can you rephrase the question? Uh, no, I think I understand what you're saying. Um, so I think you're right. I think it makes it really complicated to figure out what our true costs are, but I think what I what we showed is our true cost per capita. Um, again, we are providing services to 40,000 um, 40, residents based on the budget that we have and the property tax base that we have. Um, the services we provide to all of them may be a little bit different than other communities, you know, maybe more of one thing than another, than another community where it's more maybe even the way it's spread out. Um, but we are providing services to all 40,000. Um, and yeah, we're happy to look into it. I know we, you know, we have been looking into studies of, you know, how many people are on campus, uh, what are the value of those facilities on campus to get, start to get a sense of, um, you know, what is the value? We, we know the land value, but we don't have necessarily the greatest snapshot of the, the facility value of all the tax exempt land. So it's something we've worked on um, and we'll continue working on, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of tax exempt property in town. We're actually, when I looked at it earlier before uh, this presentation, um, we're one of the highest, if not the highest uh, community in terms of percentage of uh, tax exempt land. We're, we're over 30%. I believe the number I've, I've seen is 38%. Mm -hmm. Mandy Joe. Thank you. Um, something that always strikes me when I look at this is how much of our operating budget is personnel costs. And the presentation you just said said was 52% of our operating budget. So that in my head leaves us with like 37 million of our operating budget as personnel costs. What I have problems trying to understand, and I don't know whether you can answer this question tonight, is, is when we increase a budget, say two and a half percent, what does that equate to in percentage increase in salaries um, per year for all of the employees that are already included in those budgets? And what would if we needed another percent or two percent increase, because we all know inflation is high. Um, um, what, what does that, what's that raw number? Like if what's that one percentage each way? Cause I don't know whether benefits increase as much, you know, when, if you're increasing a salary by one and 1% say, I don't know what the benefit increases, whether that's also 1%. So can someone speak to if we were, what that 1% or 2% increase in salaries means in a raw dollar amount in the budget for every increase to help me understand what what numbers we'd be talking about. Yeah, so I don't think we'll be able to answer that tonight. It, it, it will really depend on the makeup of the salaries that you're looking at. Um, for example, when I was at the schools, uh, there was a time when we had a lot of teachers at the um, uh, at the top. And so so when we think about increases, we think about steps and colas. Um, there's sort of two components to salary increases. And so the makeup of your your staff will dictate that. Um, but it, but to your, sorry, to your, to your initial question about a 1% call, that we could calculate that. I just don't have that um, information handy at this time. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Irv Rhodes? Um, Sean, to you and your team who put this all together, I really want to congratulate you. And I'm, it's really an outstanding job. It really makes all the numbers uh, jump out at you and, be, and, and become live and rather than something dead and stale. It, still, it's a remarkable job and a remarkable effort. So I want to congratulate you and your staff and team. A uh, couple of things that uh, sort of st stood out to me was that the uh, new growth projection for 24 was $650,000. And I don't expect you to answer that, but that's a uh, a low number and it for whatever reason uh that is uh it is a, a sort of like a red flag for us going forward uh and i think we need to really pay attention to that 
The second thing that is that uh, you indicated there's 20 to 25,000 residents who carry the majority of the burden of uh, paying uh, taxes, et cetera. And that number sort of was larger than the number that I had thought was uh, in relationship to full-time residents. And uh, I, if you have any clarification on that, I would like that. Uh, and, and, and finally, um, the uh, rate, the, the uh, thing that stunned me, and maybe I'm, I'm missing something here, is that uh, we're not projecting a uh, override for uh, 24. Uh, and I uh, thought that the uh, uh, new school building would be, uh, would be going for an override in 24. So that jumped out at me. Thank you. Yeah, so um, so we're not projecting a tax override for 24. Um, there may be a debt exclusion vote in this coming year, which is a little bit different than an override. An override is just for regular taxes for operating budget. Um, a debt exclusion is specifically for the debt related to a capital project. Um, and so that vote may happen uh, this year, but even if it does happen this year, the actual Debt associated associated with it won't be till a future year um, when the building project uh, is, gets underway. Um, so, so you're you're right on that. There 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 is the anticipation of a debt exclusion vote um, on the population. So it was just a ballpark number, but um, I think the thing that when I think about it is how many are, um, residents are not. I'm not thinking about residents that are maybe in apartments that are that are tax paying apartments. I'm thinking about residents that are on tax exempt land, um, but it, it was a ballpark number. So it may be a little bit lower or higher than, than that number. Um, and then your comment on the new growth. So uh, 650 is sort of our, our standard new growth that we use in the budget at this point in the year. Um, Jen LaFountain and I looked at it earlier um, the last 10 years, I think have averaged maybe about 700,000. So it's a little bit higher than that. Um, New growth and many of these other revenues are what we call elastic revenues, which when the economy is good, you know, these revenues grow significantly, but these are also the revenues that can snap back really quickly when the economy contracts and there's and there's less going on. Um, so we're always a little bit more, more conservative with what we call our elastic revenues, um, especially early in the process like uh, we are here today. Thank you. Kathy, Shane. Uh Thank you, as always, for starting off this discussion. I just have a couple um, more, one question to follow up on what Andy was saying about taxable units. And I think um, one thing we haven't done is really be able to explain to the larger public what it means to have such a large part of our land not be taxed in terms of the burden on the rest of us. And when I was looking at even um, a simple calculation of if we do a debt exclusion, how many units does it get divided by an Amherst versus Northampton? So take two towns the same size and they divide it by a lot more people than we do because they have tax paying units. So that that's where this comes from, this extremely tight budget that we've got. So I think it, one of the things we could do, um, and we were just talking about strategies around this, is start talking about what other large public universities pay to their towns um, and be putting some pressure on it. Um, it, it and it, we could do private side too. So I'm just saying, you know, start with uh, what does University of Vermont pay? What does Lowell, UMass, uh, what does go through a few of those. So I just think it's for people to understand what a box we're in. Um, the other more general comment is, Sean, you showed going backwards in time, the share of state aid as our budget. I think if you go back 20 or 30 years, particularly for the school budget, you'll see an even more declining picture because aid as a share of our budget used to be bigger. So our tax dollar doesn't go as far as it used to because we're not getting an infusion. So I'll just put a plug for some votes tomorrow. There is a vote on the ballot that would redirect some money toward education and roads. Um, so it's just to think of, you know, outside, I think if it's outside of our box, there's some things we can do within our box, but there's some things where we have to think of outside. So my, my question on that data 
is local receipts, and this week I'm on finance, so we'll get to see it tomorrow. But local receipts, you have not returning to where it was a couple years ago or three years ago. So I just want to ask more about that tomorrow, because um, your projections last year ended up um, giving us a pretty big surplus this year that we were able to give more money back. So I just want to look at the projections for revenues, the projections for expenditures. And that was one as those tiny little numbers flew by um, that that I noticed on, on how are we being, I like underestimating revenues because I would hate to overestimate them, but I don't want to do it to the detriment of budgeting. So I, I just think this, it's a tough thing to look at these numbers because we all wish there were more. Um, and I, I think I'll just wait for finance tomorrow for more the for the more of the specifics. Yeah, I'll just quickly say there's again there's some conservatism built into the local receipts section in particular because again that's the area of our budget that is most prone to swings in the economy um, and that we saw during the pandemic fluctuated the most. Um, and then the other thing I'll say is if you go back in time, there are some uh, one-time revenues that we've received in the past that are not recurring revenues, but that's. To your point, we'll talk get into the weeds tomorrow at Finance Committee. Okay. Dorothy. Um, I have a question about the past. Uh, a few years ago, or maybe it was last year, I have no sense of time, Northampton did a um, tax override for just regular expenses. And I thought that was kind of shocking. And I felt, well, we don't do that in Amherst. But my question is, have we in fact in Amherst in the last 20 years or so done a... Um, I keep getting confused between the debt exclusion. Okay, tax override for just regular expenses. Yeah, um, Jen, you may remember the exact year. I think it was 2011 was the last time we did it. And I don't know what the specific, um, if there was a specific um, cause behind the override or if it was just general, but was it 2011, Jen? It was 2011, yes. So we, we have done it in the past. Northampton has a... Um, you know, a unique sort of financial system that works well for them, where they do these overrides regularly, as uh, Sonia mentioned earlier, um, and they build up a fiscal stability fund, and they use that to balance their budget. And again, that process has worked well for them over several, several years. Do you recommend it for Amherst? I don't know enough about it um, to know. I think our, our system has also worked well for us. Um, so, so we haven't really dove into it too much. Okay, thank you. It means your taxes would be raising going up. <laughs> Just to be clear, every time you vote a tax override, your taxes go up on your house. Uh, Jennifer, show. Thank you. So um, this is my first time participating. So you have to forgive me if I have some basic questions. Paul said at the beginning that this meeting is just the first step in the, in the, in the budget process for fiscal 24 before goals are set. But then we saw a page that basically said, uh, the elementary schools and the regional schools will be getting 2.5%. I assume that's 2.5% above our current fiscal year. So it, and, and it said that it was a working assumption and it, so I assume it's not decided yet, but it kind of feels like it's already decided. I, I realize it hasn't been voted on yet. So from my perspective as a new school committee member, it kind of feels like the town or the town council tells the schools, here's, here's what you'll get for this fiscal year. Here, and, and then the schools does as, as best we can with it. Um, but, but I guess my question is when or how is the opportunity for the school committee and the district to tell the town, this is what we need. This is what we need to have the programming and the curriculum and the staffing and the salaries that we think best serves our students. Is that this meeting? Is that like a future public hearing? Like what is the opportunity for for us to communicate to you, this is what we need, as opposed to you telling us, this is what you get. Mr. Bachman, do you want to start yeah. that? Excuse me, excuse me, we do not do loud demonstrations. Your signs are great, but thank you. So we are saying what we can afford. This is, we show, we start when we, those last two sheets are really important. Those are the sheets that the finance committee will start looking at tomorrow. Um, the first sheet is our revenue. We show you where the money's coming from and, and what we're estimating for next year. And then we show where the money 
could go. I mean, it's a projection of where we go. We look at what our debt, what we have to pay out in our debt payments. We have what we're likely to pay out for a PVTA and our uh, op our other uh, responsibilities on those fronts. And then we sort of take out what's left and divide it up by three between the school for the, the, the regional school district, the, the um, school district. And at this point, that dividing that up equals two and a half percent for each entity. Uh, if we can find out new new revenue to come in, or if the council recommends that we divide that up differently, that's all a, a, an option available to us. So what this is the first meeting of us sharing the data that we have at this point in time. Admittedly, we're nine months or eight months ahead of before we're we're projecting a budget a year and a half that's going to be operating next year. So um, it's the best um, best estimate on what our it's and it's all driven by revenue right now, and that's what we're we're looking at. Could you repeat what those four things were again? The regional school, the elementary school, and where the, the library and the town. Oh. Those are the four <laughs> entities. Yeah. Sean, is there anything you want to add to that? No, only that I think you know one of the core things that's been in existence almost every year since I've been here is that um, all the departments get the same increase. Um, that it promotes sort of all the departments working together. Um, it doesn't pit departments against each other. And that's been again a, a pretty core element to um, to our projections outside of the creation of a, a new department. Sean, could you just for the purposes of other people who have watched this budget and in this case myself, last year you started out in November saying what percent and by the time we finished you were at what percent? Yeah, um, so I don't remember the exact percentages, but I think to your point is we started out with a lower amount that we thought we could fund. Um, as state aid and other numbers came in better, we increased the amount uh, for operating budgets, um, again, across the board. Um, so I think what we ended up with, well, I think FY23 is a good example. We started with a 2.5% increase. As state aid came in better, we ended with a 3% increase for all departments. Um, as state aid came in, you know, if we found some other new revenue source this year, I'd like to propose another half percent because I think operating budgets, uh, as we made the case to the council, in FY21, operating budgets took a 0% increase, and we've never made up that difference in operating budgets. And we we sort of did this year by doing an extra half percentage point, um, but from my vantage point, we're still behind a year um, in our operating budgets. Thank you. Um, Andy? Yeah, there are several things that have been mentioned that I wanted to um, add a little bit to. Um, Dorothy had asked about override history and the point was made it was 2011. Um, that was uh, a very careful plan that uh, was felt that was necessary coming out of the 2009 recession that followed 2008 when, as you remember, there was a huge financial problem on the uh, global level and uh, that was um, why uh, the finance committee at that time, which I was a member of, it was the old town meeting days, <laughs> proposed that it was funded um, and it was actually, uh, excuse me, an override is an authorization. Um, the decision was actually made to implement it over a series of several years and not do it all in one year, even though it was authorized in a single, in one single vote. And it was careful planning to bring us out of that recession. And uh, so that's the history of that override. And uh, as Lynn pointed out, there's been always a hesitance to ask because I think one of the things that we recognize is that we don't um, show in our projections what the amount of dollars per av per median um, residence is um, as a comparative number, but it is quite high in Amherst. And therefore to ask um, homeowners um, who are on many of whom are on limited income for an override is a difficult decision that this council has to make from time to time because that's part of why we're elected to make hard decisions, but it isn't an easy one to make. Um, and as uh, far as the um, 
uh, questions that are coming up about process just real quickly. Uh, as Sean pointed out, there's been a um, feeling of over a long period of time that it is by and large a fair result of the library to the police department, to all of the uh, public safety, um, health departments and everything else that we try and um, not um, make skewed decisions, but there are reasons to consider it and there is a process to do so. And the budget forum that was talked about on the 21st is really for the public to come in and give their thoughts about the budget and their desires for the budget. The council um, will adopt budget guidelines. And if the council decides um, that um, it would like in the council guidelines to suggest a different policy, that is the time to do it because the, the goal of it is to, to make that decision or at least give guidance to the town manager from the council before the uh, budgets um, are adopted for the various departments and functional areas of uh, our government. And uh, just to be clear about the process, and then I'll conclude, um, is that uh, the finance committee develops a proposed set of uh, a proposed guideline and uh, the proposed guideline will, the finance committee will start working on tomorrow. Um, it will provide a first draft to the council for consideration on December 5th. It does not have to be adopted on December 5th. That's always done in two parts deliberately because after the December 5th uh, meeting in which the initial discussion can take place, if the council um, has strong feelings about changes it would like to see in the guideline document, um, it sends it back to the finance committee. Finance committee will meet on December 6th, uh, the day after to consider it. And then it comes back um, to the council on December 19th. And that's the actual date in which there's anticipation of action. So, okay. thank you, Lynn. Irv. Uh, I, I just, I think that for the sake of myself and others out there in the audience who may want to know the answer to this question is the difference between the debt exclus exclusion and an override and, uh, and what the impact of either of those are in relationship to taxes. I could Sean take that or, one. Uh, yeah, no, I recently did a presentation on it. So, um, so an override is a permanent increase to your taxes. So that's going above the two and a half percent allowable increase in your in the levy limit each year. Um, it's a permanent amount above that, um, and it's typically for operations. Whereas a debt exclusion, you go over it on a temporary basis, um, only for the life of the debt. Um, there's different thresholds in terms of voting each one. A, a debt exclusion requires a two-thirds uh, majority vote by the town council. An override would require a majority vote. They both require passage by um, the elected vote or the, the registered voters of the town in order to go into effect. Um, but the, the easiest way to think about it is a tax override is a permanent increase in the taxing ability of the town, and it's typically for operations. A debt exclusion is a temporary increase in the taxing ability of the town, and it's usually specifically tied to the debt of a capital project, like a school project or a, another building project. I would say debt exclusions are most common with um, MSBA school projects uh, in the state. I want to make sure that, Sean, do you go one step further? And you mentioned in one requires two-thirds vote for the council, the other requires a majority of the council. Mm -hmm. What does the population vote have to be in both cases? They both are majority in both cases. Thank you. Uh, Mandy Joe. Yeah, I just wanted to address Jennifer's question a little further, which is the, the other place um, that the groups, the school committee, library trustees, and council can discuss that allocation of those projected revenues is in the budget coordinating group. It's why that's technically part of this agenda is the meeting of the BCG, but I believe any of the bodies can request from the manager to 
for the manager to call an, an extra meeting or an, a separate meeting of the budget coordinating group to have those discussions if any of the committees believe it's necessary. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments from the bodies gathered? Sean and all of you that have worked with Sean, thank you so much for an excellent presentation. I'm going to now turn to Allison McDonald to adjourn her group. The Emmer School Committee is adjourned. Thank you. Uh, Austin Sret. Jones Library Board of Trustees is adjourned. Okay. Uh, Andy Steinberg, the Finance Committee. Finance Committee meeting, which is a separate meeting within this uh, meeting of the hall, is adjourned. And before I adjourn the town council meeting, we will um, take a five minute break and then we will immediately go into our next meeting and we will begin very soon after that with the tax classification hearing for this year. We will also have public comment early in the early in that meeting uh, and certainly invite all of you that would like to make public comment to stay uh, as well as being on Zoom with us. So we're going to take a five minute break and be right back. Thank you. As council members return, please turn your video back on so I know we can get started. Athena, 
please take the screen down. Okay, as counselors return, please turn your videos back on. Pam, you need to turn your video on. Turn your video on. Thank you. Dorothy, when you return, please turn your video back on. Okay. Um, Michelle, you're back. All right. Um, I have news for you. It's still November 7th. Um, and this is now our regular town council meeting. Um, I'm not going to go through all of the preliminaries I've gone through before. Uh, in the interest of moving on. I want to mention that there is one public comment period. No, excuse me, there are two. There is one during the hearing that will be held in just a moment. And then there is another general public comment period for those of you that have come for that purpose. Um, the announcements are on the agenda for the upcoming meetings of the council. One that has been mentioned already is November 21st. And that is our public forum on the FY24 budget. And I believe we are setting the time for that to start at what time, Athena? We'll let you know. And then December 5th, we have the state of the town address. Um, we are going to go on very quickly so that there is no more confusion. And I'm going to move item 8C up in the agenda. 8C is the motion postponed on November 1st. I'm going to make a motion and seek a second. I move to postpone the motion that is on the floor made by Lynn Griesmer and seconded by Anna Devlin Gothier to November 14th, 2022 at 6.30. Is there a second? Shane seconds. Thank you. I'm going to very quickly speak to the motion. I have polled the town council and all members have indicated they are available on November 14th, 2022 at 6.30 p.m. I am doing this because there are several amendments, amendments to the motion that is on the floor and some new motions under consideration. Thus, this item will take up considerable time. The town council began meeting at five o'clock tonight, which means we're now into our fourth hour. Um, and we are now engaged in our regular town council meeting, and we have quite a few items to go. So with that, I'm going to ask if there are any questions, and if not, I'm going to bring it to a vote. Okay. Shalini. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Mandy Johannigy. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Todd. Aye. Felicia Walker. Yes. Thank you. There's one other thing uh, that I would like to mention, and that is item 14 on the agenda. 
the town manager's appointment of the human resource director. Due, the, due to the timing of the town manager's appointment memo being not within the 48 hour period and with consideration of the town's commitment to the highest standards of transparency, I've decided to move the confirmation of the human resource director to the special meeting agenda on November 14th. With that, we are going to go on to the hearing. It's a tax classification hearing. Uh, principal assessor Kim Yu and members of the board of assessors are with, her, with us. Uh, that includes, um, I saw them earlier. Uh, hi, Lee Hines. Um, and Richard Morris is probably in the audience and Ken Hargraves. So Kim uh, and Sean Mangano. And Lynn, can I just ask a quick question before um, Kim goes ahead? Uh, so we have the FY23 tax classification hearing presentation. Uh, we put the residential exemption study presentation in the packet. Mm -hmm. um, do you want both presented or just the FY23 classification hearing? I think the classification hearing is fine. Okay, thank you. Take it away, Kim. Okay, thank you. Um, just bear with me while I share my screen. Kim, there's something yes. wrong with your uh, microphone. And I don't know what, but we have a great deal of difficulty hearing, understanding you. Okay. Um, let me move a little closer to my computer. Is that a little better? Yes. Okay. I'm just too far away. <laughs> Kim, do you want me All to right. share it and just click through it or do you want to go ahead and do it? Uh, go ahead, Sean. Okay. If you'd like to share, that would be fine. Don't move away, Kim. <laughs> I won't move away. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. So this looks very familiar to many of you. Um, and before I actually get started, uh, please feel free to jump in if, if I do move too far away. Um, so go ahead, Sean, and go to the next slide, please. Okay, so this is just a reminder of what we will be discussing tonight. Um, we'll be voting on the single or split tax rate, uh, the open space discount, small commercial exemptions, and the residential exemption. Next you need slide. to speak more loudly and closer and slowly. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm sorry. so the, weird, the weird thing is, Lynn, I can hear her fine. So it must be something between um, the room audio and the and the Zoom audio because I can hear her um, well. So, um, so I just want to point that out that I, I can hear her fine. And we had so can I. Problem the last time. Okay. okay. All right. Go ahead, Kim. Okay. Um, so the tax classification is an act that was passed 44 years ago in 1978, which requires the municipalities um, to classify real and personal property into these four classes, the residential, the commercial, the industrial, and the personal property. And if you could go to the next slide, please. Here I have for you the definitions of all of the classes, which we did go over the other night, but briefly for anyone that wasn't there, um, the residential class includes um, any units that are for human habilitation. So any, any unit that you can live in, um, single family homes, um, um, two family homes, three family homes, apartment buildings. Um, these will include uh, accessory land um, such as swimming pools, garages, um, basically anything that is not attached to the home. Um, the commercial, commercial property includes um, any place that would conduct a business such as storefronts, offices, um, as well as chapter land, which is for farming and recreational use. Um, industrial properties, again, is just the manufacturing. Um, and then again, quickly, the uh, personal property is any sort of um, taxable property that is inside of the business or home um, if basically, if you can tip a building upside down and shake it out, anything that would fall out would be considered um, personal property. Go to the next slide, please. Um, this is just showing you the um, distribution by classification. Um, so we have a total of 6,938 parcels here in Amherst that are taxable. Um, so this just shows you that 88% of those are residential about uh, 6.5 is commercial, 
4.5 is personal property, and we have about less than one that would be the industrial. And I just want to pause for a moment and just check in that everyone can hear me still okay. Yes. Okay, thank you. Go ahead to the next slide, Sean. Um, so this slide just gives you a brief overview um, of what the split tax rate is. And that's something, again, that we will be voting on tonight. Um, so if we vote in a factor of one, this is a single tax rate. So this will continue on as we have been for many years now here in Amherst. Um, if we decide to vote a factor of less than one, this will allow us to split the tax rate and shift the burden within the commercial, industrial, and personal property class um, so that the residential class will be paying a lower rate. And then if we do a factor greater of one, this will do the exact opposite. Um, and it will give the commercial class, uh, commercial, industrial, and personal property class a lower rate than those of the residential uh, class. Next slide, please. Um, so this slide is new to you all. Um, this is the updated information that I was not able to present to you uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, so basically what this is, is showing you the impact of uh, a split and a single tax rate with our projected tax rate for the single um, for this year. Um, this shows our average single family home of 446,953. And if we had a single tax rate at $20.10 per thousand, which again is our projected for this year, uh, taxes would be about $9,000 on average. Um, and if we did a split tax rate uh, with a, a tax rate of $18.85 per thousand, um, it would be in and around um, $8,500 in tax for the average single family home, um, showing there a difference of $960. Um, and then if you look over on the commercial industrial, um, the average commercial value in our town is $554,396. So again, if we do a single tax rate of $20.10 per thousand, we've got about an 11,000 um, average eleven thousand dollar average tax bill, um, and if we do a split tax rate, where the again the um, residential rate would be eighteen eighty five, it would put the commercial rate at thirty dollars and nineteen cents per thousand, with an average of a seventeen hundred dollar tax bill. Um, so difference in commercial between single tax rate and um, the split tax rate would be about fifty five hundred dollars. So you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so um, again, this is just sort of a, a quick breakdown of how the residential exemption works. Um, so this is another thing that we'll be voting on tonight. Um, basically, you have the ability to give up to 35% of the average value of the residential properties as an exemption on the assessed value. Um, and this is something that is only in the residential class. So this will, this will shift the burden only inside the residential class. This will not affect the commercial, industrial, and personal property. Um, however, it will um, raise the tax rate uh, for all classes. Um, and you can go to the next slide, please. Um, and again, these are just the qualifications. Um, for the owner-occupied parcels, again, it's only the residential class. Um, so it's single family homes, condominiums, part of two and three family homes, and part of mixed use properties. Um, Non-qualifying parcels would be, again, non-owner-occupied properties. Um, so second homes and rentals, homes rented by um, and occupied by family members who are not listed on the deed. Um, properties that are held in trusts, uh, regardless of the purpose of the trust, any large apartment buildings, and then uh, nursing homes, group homes, and assisted living facilities. Um, so again, I just want to uh, remind you about the um, properties held in the trust and homes that are not um, occupied by the person that's on the deed. This could negatively affect um, quite a few members of our community. So just keep that in mind um, when voting on that. And you can go to the next slide. Um, so here again is just the uh, pie chart that shows you 
that we are about 66% owner occupied versus the 34% non owner occupied. Um, and again, I think that I want to reiterate these numbers would probably adjust um, with more study that's done uh, if we do decide that we want to um, input the residential exemption. There's a lot of work that would need to go in to make sure that these numbers are accurate. Um, anybody that does not respond to any questionnaires that have been mailed and or will be mailed, um, if this is something we do decide to do, have that ability to um, to, to file an abatement and dispute that charge. So um, again, just keep that in mind. I know it's not in the presentation, but um, something to really think about is that's also going to cost our overlay to increase um, for these particular abatements. So just another little uh, thought when thinking about this particular exemption. Next slide, please. Um, so a very quick summary. Um, again, it's just a redistribution of the tax levy inside of the residential class. So um, for those property owners, um, this exemption has been labeled as a misdemeanor um, since it actually does shift inside of the residential class and does not, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't consider someone's ability to pay um, it, there is a potential that um, you know, someone would have a higher tax bill. Um, and then also uh, tends to affect our renters in apartment buildings um, because it's, it's possible that the apartment buildings will have an increased tax rate as well. Um, and again, you know, if, if those who either choose to live the apartment life or can't afford to purchase a home um, may see that negatively affected them uh, because that apartment building will go up in um, rent potentially. Um, so we can go to the next slide, please. Kim, the, um, the exemption is, is, is not a misdemeanor, it's a misnomer, right? <laughs> sorry, yes, thank you, Lee. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, the other exemption that we will be voting on tonight is the small commercial exemption. And this is pretty much the exact opposite of the residential exemption. Um, this will um, be for businesses of 10 or less people of the value of less than a million dollars. Um, and basically what would, it would do is give those businesses uh, an exemption and um, shift the burden to those of, of 11 or more employees. Um, being that we don't have very many uh, large businesses in Amherst, um, you will see later on that I would recommend that this it, um, be voted that we do not accept the small commercial exemption. Uh, next slide, please. So again, just the recommendations here um, by myself, as well as Paul, um, our town manager, that we continue on with the single tax rate for all property types, so a factor of one, and that we do not vote in the residential, small commercial, or open space uh, exemptions. And I didn't touch on the open space exemption because we don't use open space here in Amherst. So um, that's it for tonight. Any questions? Okay, okay, I'm going to ask if there's any questions from the council. This time we've already had a presentation of this last meeting and um, I think it was last meeting. Um, maybe it was back in October. Pam. Thank you, and thanks again for this presentation. Each time we hear it, we understand a little better. Um, one of the things that we heard in a recent uh, rental registration bylaw forum was, uh, or input from a survey that we put out, was uh, concern from landlords that um, that we were that we were seeing that their assessed values were going up. And that they might pass their assessed these increased values on to the tenants. Um, our, I need to ask really specifically: Are income-producing properties actually being assessed to account for income, or is it simply like the rest of us? You know, big spoiler alert here: We're all paying more taxes. Uh, can you answer that question, please? Sure. Um, so specifically, I can't say each and every property is using the income and expense method. Um, however, 
Can you hear me a little better? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so I can't say specifically which properties are using the income and expense method other than the fact that um, the larger apartment buildings, any commercial industrial buildings would be using the income and expense method. However, um, when it does come to uh, smaller, for example, four family or less, three family, two family, um, single family homes that are rented, um, unfortunately we can't use the income and expense method because we would have to use it evenly across the board. And for those properties that our that are owner occupied, there is no income and expense. Um, so the state really frowns upon the mixed use of the um, income and expense method in that form. But what I can say is yes, the, the larger apartment buildings are using the income and expense method. Okay. Are there any other questions from the council? I'm going to move, okay, Jennifer. Yes, I, I guess it's following up on that somewhat. Um, so we don't have a lot of large businesses in town, but some of our large apartment complexes could be considered like a large business in terms of the income they generate. But are you saying that we wouldn't, the reason for not wanting to tax them higher is because it would be passed on to the tenant? Yes and no. Um, <laughs> so the the apartment complexes cannot be considered commercial based um, based on a state regulation that they are right. someone's residence. Um, and so that it has to be qualified as a residential parcel. Um, however, again, we do use the income and expense method on those buildings um, currently. So whether or not the tenants are, are seeing that increase, um, you know, I'm not aware of that, but, but again, we do use the income and expense methods for those parcels. But Jennifer, to um, building on Kim's response, in terms of the residential exemption, one of the reasons we don't recommend the residential exemption is because that would shift a, a very large additional tax bill um, onto the large apartment uh, complexes that we do believe would ultimately get passed on um, to renters. Thank you. Pam, your hand is still up, but I'm assuming it's not down. I'm going to move to the audience, either in the room or on Zoom, and ask if there's any questions or comments. Uh, seeing none, are there? I'm sorry. Yes, there is. Gabrielle, uh, Gabrielle Davila, Davila, I think it is. Please enter the room, state your name, and your comment. This is regarding tax rates. Oh, sorry. I wanted to make a comment about a different topic. When should I do that? We're going to do that next. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other comments with regard to the tax rates that we're doing the hearing on at this time? Okay, seeing none. Any other counselor comments? Then, yes, Kathy? Uh, yes, to, uh, just to make sure I heard it correctly, Kim, what you were saying for the small business owner, it seems to me it's similar to the residents analogy that some small business owners are renters of their space. So that even if you were trying to benefit them, you wouldn't get them, you would only get the small business owner that also owned their building. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you. Michelle, you had your hand up. Okay. Uh, are there any other comments from the council? Seeing none, then I am declaring the hearing closed. Pardon me. We need to, we just need to do a vote on the close closing the public hearing. Ah, I'm sorry. I'd like to make a motion to close the hearing. Is there a second? Second. Okay, then we're moving to close the hearing. Lynn, I would just like to say thank you to everybody for bearing with me with the with the volume. <laughs> Absolutely, thank you. Um, Shalini Belmil. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Uh, Lynn Green, Anna Devon Gothier. Aye. 
Eileen Grishmas. Aye. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Uh, Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Aye. Alicia Walker. Yes. The hearing is closed. Okay. All right. Um, I just want to make a couple comments uh, so that we catch everybody up who's joined us. Uh, prior to the beginning of public comment or to the beginning of the hearing, uh, I want to make sure the people in the audience, whether on Zoom or Amherst Media or the town room, uh, understand that we voted earlier to postpone the motion on the floor that was left over from our November 1st, 2022 meeting to Monday, November 14th at 2000, on 2022 at 6.30 p.m. In addition, um, we're pleased to see so many public educators and students were with us earlier today. And we invite you to make public comment as well, recognizing, however, that it is the school committee that you negotiate with, and it is the school committee that submits their budget to us. So would those people who would like to make public comment, please raise their hands. Lynn, I have a sign-in sheet for public comment here. Okay. And has any everybody who just raised their hand signed in on the sheet? Thank you. And then we have other people in the audience. Okay. And so Athena, I'm going to have you um, begin. The first person on the public uh, comment. Hold on before you do that. First of all, we're going to allow public comment for only three minutes. We do have a clock. If you can make it less than three minutes, we've already been sitting here for four hours and going on five. Um, and we do want to hear from you. When you come forward, you come sit at the desk, you press the little button. It's on. It's on. Thank you. And make sure you speak into it so we can hear you. Okay. Athena. Lynn, can I? Yes. Over here, Lynn. Yeah. May. Michelle. Briefly. <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't see where. <laughs> Quickly, I just wanted to clarify that this is a public comment. General public General comment. General public comment. Okay. I also just want to express frustration that while we have been here for four hours, mm -hmm. these folks have been here for a long time and I've watched many of them walk out. Right. And I feel a lot of concern about that because they came here to engage with us. And I understand that we have a protocol that we're following, but I'd really like to think about how we can retain folks who are coming to speak and figure out ways that make that possible, so. Thank you. Um, all right, so, Athena, are you ready to begin? The first person on the list for public comment is Vera Cage. Good evening, good evening everyone. My name is Vera Cage and I live at 12 Long Meadow Drive, apartment 21 in Amherst. Um, I'm here to support the educators um, and to ask that you support um, education in this community and pri prioritize it. Um, I'm not going to waste too much time um, on, on the subject, but I do want to share um, some salaries of a department that um, has a lot of six-figure salaries, $159,965, $101,706, excuse me, I'm going to go back to that figure, um, one hundred nineteen thousand three hundred eighty-two, one hundred sixteen thousand one hundred sixty-two, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, and at least twenty other um, town employees enjoy a six-figure salary. Um, and that's the Amherst Police Department. 
um, and we have a police officer that's making more than that $190,000 salary that our town manager um, earns. So I think that I'm really concerned about the paraeducators um, salaries um, and that it is a disgrace to know that across the street, we have a $1.8 million um, renovation project to um, overhaul all the parking to put, which is good, a park, um, but you know, a million dollars is coming out of the uh, CPA funds, the Community Preservation Act funds. And, you know, as a person who's working class, um, raising um, a family in this community, it's always jarring to know how much money can be flying around. Um, and then we're not taking care of the people at the bottom to shore them up, you know, so that their salaries or their income is close to, you know, the highest, closer <laughs> um, to the highest paying members of our community, um, town employees. Uh, where is the time that I have left? 30 seconds. Um, I have more to say, but I want to have you all um, think thoughtfully about um, the nine individuals, the nine young people um, that the police uh, confronted um, and detained, and that they also are high school students trying to make it, trying to survive, whether it be their junior year or their se senior year. Um, and they really want this to be behind them and that you all hold, including the town manager, power over their fate and their destiny and their future and their emotional well being. Um, I'm out of time. I just want to thank everybody for the time that you are putting in to listen earnestly. And, um, and I think that we are able to do things in this community when we put ourselves behind it. I've seen projects move and I want the same energy for the young people that also need to be able to be supported um, because we're gonna pay more if we don't take care of our young people when they need us the most. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> the next person on my sign-in sheet is actually um, the first person on the Zoom list. So should we alternate for in-person and Zoom? Yes. Julian Hines. Please enter the room. Thank you. State your name and where you live, Julian. Hi there. Thank you, everyone. Um, I have actually moved. Uh, my new address is 41 Pine Grove. Um, but it is great to be with everyone tonight. I had to duck out for a meeting from in person, but uh, I am just here to reflect what I think you see in a lot of the signs and faces of the educators who are here to join you, which is a commitment to our schools, to our town and to our community. Our educators have been committed to raising bright young people like myself and many of my friends for over a decade now. and. Uh, they've done it again and again and again for multiple generations. And I would just like to say that at them asking to keep a wage that is rising with the cost of living doesn't feel like a ballpark too far, given some of the statistics Bureau just mentioned, as well as us embarking on a pretty large track renovation and library project. I'm not against any of these things per se, but I am more feeling that it is important we equally value our educators, our town staff, and the people who are at the bottom of the totem pole. That's, in my opinion, what social justice is about. And it's important that we value these voices, value their contributions to our community, and value their livelihood, quite frankly. And it's embarrassing the fact that our school district 
has to have basically a mini survival center for some of our paraeducators. That's not good. And I think, quite frankly, there's no other way to put it than it's sad for me and our, my fellow students to know that this is what is happening to some of the staff members in our building. And we feel for them and we understand the pain they're going through and the right avenue to reach justice is to come to you guys and say, hey, these people need to be paid a living wage and we need to value the work that is done here in town by all of our town staff people, especially those who put in long hours and aren't justly compensated. So I appreciate everyone for listening to me tonight and I hope to join you at your next meeting discussing the CSSJC. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Athena. The next person on the list is Lamikio McGee. Um, I don't have your residence, so if you could just say, state your name and where you live when you speak. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Lamiko McGee. I am an ARPS employee and I am the APA president. Um, and I just wanted to speak tonight about, um, about education in the Amherst community, the community that I serve. Um, I, the relationship, I, and I think most people know this in here, and so it's just a reminder that the relationship between the quality of schools and the tax base and the value of homes in the community is, um, is, is absolutely tied together. And so the quality of the schools and the quality of service we provide in the schools is directly associated with whether people actually wanna live in this community or not. If we want young families with children to move in these communities, they make those decisions to buy, to purchase homes based on the quality of the schools. And that's one of the, the, the biggest decisions they make in their lives um, is, is where they live and where they educate their children. And so I think we need to think about that um, I heard someone say that, that this may be an issue of affordability. We can't afford to have poor schools if you want to have this type of community where you have a, uh, a tax base in which you can build a new track or build a or renovate a library or build some brand new schools. And I will tell you, it's, it's you know, we would love to have a new school, but it's the people in those schools that serve the children that determines whether they get a great education or not. Because I've worked in some places that I've worked in some brand new schools and that's not what makes the school. It's the, it's the teachers, it's the educators, it's the parents, it's the clericals, it's the administrators in that building that serve the students that make the school. There's a crisis in education right now. And I've asked the school committee and I ask you town council, what is your plan? Educators are, leaving the field. That is how stressful working in education is right now. Um, and, on top of, and on top of the stress um, in a post-pandemic society and managing the behaviors of students um, and being short-staffed, then to have to be concerned about how you are going to take care of your family uh, because you're just not earning a living wage. Um, the community that you love, that you serve, that you can't afford to live in it. And that is the, that is unfortunately um, what our employees are dealing with right now. We can't even afford to live in these communities that we serve. And so I want you to, to think about that. Um, that 1%, it's really interesting that we've been negotiating for a long time. You would think that 1% uh, would be stuck in someone's head. They would know it off the top of their heads um, that 1% of, of what our payroll is. I will say that we didn't ask for 14 million. I'm not sure where they get that number, um, but they just keep on repeating the same information. Um, but that's not what we asked for. But we do ask for uh, fair negotiations and for us to get a living wage for our employees and for us to serve our students and create the quality schools that will be necessary to maintain the tax base that you want here in Amherst. Thank you. Thank you for joining us.
The next person on Zoom is Gabriel Gavila. Hi, my name is Gabriel Davila. I'm a District 5 resident, although, again, I'm calling in from college. Uh, I just wanted to look over um, what the, a, the union has been asking for um, and just to sort of reframe the conversation as it's going. So the union has been asking for direct negotiations with the school committee uh, open to all their members. I mean, that's in, an entirely reasonable demand, I think. And I think that any like basic knowledge of the way unions operate would tell you that that ability to directly negotiate is critical for the union to serve its purpose. Uh, they want respect and adequate pay. I mean, that should be obvious. They want substitute pay, right? And this isn't even something that's going to necessarily impact their union members. This is just to keep the work conditions better. And then what do they want? They want cost of living adjustments because we're living in a period with huge inflation, safe working conditions, a reasonable workload. So what are we doing here? I mean, we're talking about educators, paraeducators, the people who help educate our students and are often helping educate the most vulnerable students, the students who need the help the most. And we have people right now at this meeting asking you, our town representatives, hey, would you mind valuing para pay and, edu and the power of an educational union as much as you value building a new park or improving our library? I mean, this should be our first priority, not just because we want to care for the people who we have unfortunately placed at the bottom of our societal totem pole, because I do think it's our responsibility as a town to take care of each other. But these, this is, this is, you know, this is not some random union. This is the educators' union, and their demands are in line with what is needed for the school to function in a good way, which is essential for students. And as was just mentioned, if the school is not educating well, you won't attract new families, and then you know you get into a spiral where things start to go downwards. So this is the time to show who we are as a community, that we're a community that values our educators as much as we value our police, right? I don't think that's unreasonable. I mean, if it was up to me, and I think if it was up to the young people of this community, and, and in general, the, the actual people of this community who you are supposed to represent, that we would represent educators at the foremost. We, we, we would want them to get more than the police and more than a new park or a library, right? So I don't think it's unreasonable that a bunch of people are gonna come on tonight and ask you to value educators as much as you value the other facets of the town. And I think that this is another opportunity for this town council and for this community to show who we are. I mean, do we want to be a community that tries to pay our educators and paraeducators the bare minimum? Or do we wanna be a community that wants to step up, provide the best school system we can and provide the best pay we can for the people who are making those students have the best experiences possible? Thank you for your comment. Next is Alex Lopez. So I'm Alex Lopez. I uh, live at 265 Potwine, um, and I also work at Summit Academy, uh, our alternate high school here in the district. Um, I appreciate that you all have been here for four hours. My school doesn't have substitutes. And like when there, someone's not there, because we're in the middle of a pandemic, we can't turn around and say, well, sorry, your class is canceled because we don't have a teacher right now. And so as a para, I end up subbing. No one subs for me as the para. And so I understand the frustration that we're here, even though the school committee is the one who's actually supposed to have uh, proposed a budget, actually had that budget be an appropriate number to deal with inflation, and that we have to come to you. But we also heard them today say, Peter said, we're not even advocating for more money. And when we've done it in the past, we've been ineffective at it. So yes, we are here advocating for more money because we see our colleagues walking out the door and we're the ones left holding them back. And a lot has been made today about uh, our paraeducators, but I actually wanted to read a statement from one of the clinicians who works in one of our highest uh, need settings. She says, I'm currently employed as a clinician for Amherst Pelham Regional School District, a title and a role that I uh, not only take very seriously, but also hold very dear to my heart. 
We have seen over the last few years the need for more therapeutic supports in our school system to provide for the ongoing needs of our students. And I will take this time to share with you all that I have done to prepare for this challenge. Because in the last five years, I've accomplished a great deal. I received my master's of social work, a graduate certificate in child welfare, my school adjustment counselor's license through the Department of Education, and my license to become an LCSW. In addition to those degrees and licenses, I'm also a certified child and adolescent trauma professional, as well as a court appointed special advocate. And I did all of this while being a single parent and battling breast cancer. While most would agree that I've earned my right to receive a living wage, the school committee has made it clear that they do not. Currently, my take-home wage is under $40,000 a year. And because of this, I'm left with no choice but to work a second job. So in addition to working over 40 hours a week for the district, I also work as a server with a catering company. And during one of my weekend shifts, I found myself serving the parents of one of my students. I hope this makes you feel as embarrassed as I was, especially so when they asked me why I was there serving their food when I was a therapeutic professional. I am currently working towards getting my LICSW, a license that is not paid for by the district, but one in which they benefit from greatly. I pay my outside supervisor $200 a month for two years in order to be able to sit for the exam. And I hope you're able to see before you a community of people that have decided to dedicate their lives to the children of this very community, your children, our children, not in the hopes of becoming rich, but with the hope that we can make this world a place where everyone's child feels seen, valued, and cared for, even when we are clearly not afforded the same luxury. When we talk about the fact that we look at our budget and prioritize our debts and then figure out how to split up the rest, that's the person you're deprioritizing. Next on Zoom, we have Tracy Zapian. Hi, so I wanted to speak about the parking on Lincoln and Sunset, but if there's other public commenters about the schools and things, I'd be happy to wait until those comments are done. Okay, Tracy, if you wanna just raise your hand again and um, we can take you at the end. Sure, yeah. that's fine. Thanks. Um, next is, I think it's Margaret Sawyer. Yeah, hi, thank you. Um, I'm here similarly to talk about the school budget um, and the, the need to, for the, the need for the town to release more money for the school committee to be able to fairly um, negotiate with the union. It's clear um, to me that it's the town that has to make the bold step of releasing that money. And I see it as a responsibility that you all have. And it makes me think about the history of how town council has worked. And I wonder if we even had a town council the last time that there was a contract passed by and not, last time that there was an educational contract with the um, with the teachers union, excuse me, I'm getting over a pretty bad cold. I know I sound kind of crazy, um, but I it seems like there's a lot of like, oh, this is how we always do the budget. This is business as usual. Now you all know, and you're the town, the new town council, and here's how we always do it. And it's going to be a lot of responsibility on you to see that business as usual could result in a strike or business as usual could result in a terrible contract negotiation because you're the ones with the purse strings. It, it appears to me, um, it appears to me that the that school committee is not able to get a giant, a, a, the big enough chunk that they need to adequately negotiate with the union unless you release it for them. And you're hearing now from your budget people that the way it always has always happened is everybody equally divides the leftover pot. We put a set, set aside an amount for savings. And it seems like it's on you all to decide whether that's what you really want to do this year or whether you're going to help school committee adequately negotiate with um, the union. And I hope you all can be bold and not just accept business as usual and how it's always been, because um, I would hate to see our teachers 
have to take drastic action. Um, I, you know, have two kids in the schools. I sub in the schools. Sometimes I see that when I do, they're desperate for subs. So there's tons of times where paras sub um, and they're all just working as hard as they can. Thank you. Next is Laura Pagliaro. I'm sorry, Pagliarulo. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thanks for your time tonight. I'm Laura Pagliarulo. I live on Concord uh, Way in Amherst. Um, appreciate you guys being here for this length of time. Um, we moved here, my husband and I, about five years ago uh, from Washington, D.C. with our two children. And um, our jobs are still in D.C. And we could have selected anywhere uh, to move. And we selected Amherst almost exclusively based on the school system, the quality of the public school system. Um, my husband and I are both products of public education. It's where our values are. We lived in communities that also valued public education, and I'm here to support the educators tonight. Uh, I wanna talk about two things um, that really resonated with me over the weekend as I was contemplating this meeting. The first is the 2% increase that teachers are requesting. You know, I think we can all agree that the past two years have been hard on everyone. And with inflation being what it is right now, um, that's really compounded this pain and made it more difficult. Um, and the 2% increase with an 8.2% inflation rate is the same as a 6% decrease in pay. And I want to make sure that point's really heard because these educators are the reason why families like myself come to this area. The second point I want to make is explicitly around the budget. So I spent some time um, looking at the budget for the high school, the middle school, and the elementary school over the weekend. And as you guys all know, these budgets incorporate not only funding for educators, but also you know, transportation, maintenance, uh, the full cost of educating students. And in looking at the total number of students in the school, um, 180 days in the year, and then the total uh, capital spend for 2023, it appears as though we are spending $18 an hour per child. And what really struck me about that figure was that that's the same that I pay my babysitter um, for my two kids. I have a child in the middle school and a child in the elementary school. And what we're asking these educators to do every day is far more than what I'm asking a babysitter to do when they take care of my child. Um, that figure, that $18 figure, combined with the um, cost of living rate, wage with inflation, um, what it tells me is that, what I hope, is that we moved here because um, of these schools and what I hope for my children. And, uh, and when I see those numbers, it doesn't strike me that this community is really prioritizing education. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. We don't have any more hands on Zoom, so I'm going to go to the list again. In the room, we have Danielle Seltza. Hello, my name is Danielle Seltzer. Um, I'm a resident of Turner's Falls, um, but I've worked in the Amherst school system since 2011. Uh, I would like to share some numbers with you all. So I'm a member of the APA negotiating team. And um, our first ask for cost of living increase was around 8% per year. Uh, our last offer at our last mediation session was 3.5% in the first year, 4% in the second year, and 5% in the third year. Um, I bring that up because I think if you do the math, it won't add up to 14 million. So I'm not sure where that number is from. The school committee's original offer was 2.5, 2.5, 2.5. Their last offer was 2.5, 2, and 2. Some other numbers I'd like to share with you. I work at Amherst Regional High School. Um, last year, we had a cost of living adjustment of 0.6% for teachers. 
that was $391 in my paycheck split up over 26 pay periods. Um, that's before taxes and deductions. The retention rate before that 0.6% increase at the regional school district was 92.7%. After last year's increase, the retention rate at the high school, the middle school and high school is 77%. If you compare that to other area districts, which you can by looking on the DESE website, you'll see that districts like Northampton, Belchertown, Granby are all in the 80s and 90s. So yes, retention is poor everywhere, but it is particularly poor in Amherst right now. Another number I'd like to share with you, there's some personal numbers. I'm 35 years old. I have a master's degree. I have 30 credits of graduate work beyond a master's degree. I'm Orton Gillingham certified. I'm licensed to teach English at the middle and high school level. I'm a licensed special educator at the middle and high school level. I have an advanced certificate in the teaching of writing and I make $1,653 per paycheck. I cannot afford to own a home. I have no equity. All I have is my income. I do not do this job for the money. I do this job because I love it. However, what I'm requesting is my dignity, my ability to only work one job and to have respect from my employer. In mediation, for those that don't know, we do not face the school committee. Everything is done over Zoom through a member of the Department of Labor. He hops back and forth, passing messages along, and we sit and wait. I recognize that we are two parties that are far apart that hopefully will come closer together, but it is hard to know how close we can come together when we do not see our employer. One request we are making is to return to tra tra traditional negotiations. A member of the school committee spoke earlier about um, the public not knowing or understanding how hard it is for him to ask for money. My response to that would say, open bargaining would solve that problem. Thank you. Next we, next we have Jeff Friedman. Hi, uh, my name is Jeff Friedman. I live in Northampton, but I'm in Amherst High School 24 year veteran of the math department. Uh, I have three children of my own, excuse me, I've got a little cold. I have three children of my own who went through the Amherst schools, the most recent of whom graduated in June of this year. I purposely chose to move to Amherst 16 years ago so that my kids could experience the excellence that is our ARPS schools. I wanna say thank you to each of you for your service to our students, our schools and our communities. And I thought the uh, school committee folks were here, but I guess not. Um, but nonetheless, okay. I will proceed. Uh, it's through your policies and yes, the budgets that you review and approve that you help continue the tradition of excellence that is our ARPS schools. I am wondering by a show of hands, how many of you have had or currently have children of your own in the schools? Some of you do, fantastic. Sorry? Some of us graduated. Oh yeah, well, fantastic, great. Thank you for your service. Thank you coming back to serve. I think we can all agree that uh, many of us are here tonight because of four things. We believe in public education. We value the remarkable tradition of excellence that's our ARP schools. We recognize that at, that excellence is the result of an unwavering commitment to our students, our faculty and our staff, a commitment that's been preserved by the labors of our predecessors on this town council, on school boards of the past, in our classrooms and in our community. And fourth, we know that our district, in our district, good is not good enough. Great is what we strive for and expect because we know that within each and every one of our students lies greatness. So I'd like to add a fifth thing, one that has appeared to be really in doubt in recent weeks and months, one that I truly hope is in fact not in doubt at all. And that is this, that we recognize that it is the people as many of my uh, previous folks have, have said, it's the people, the employees of this district, your employees who are the keepers of this excellence 
that is our ARPS schools. That includes the bus drivers, the cafeteria workers, the custodians, our administrators, uh, the teachers, and absolutely our parents.